Welcome to eVirtual. My name is Peter Wooding, and thank you for joining us. Today's session, How COVID-19 is Changing the Automotive Industry and EV Market. Today, we have two great speakers who will share their knowledge, experience, and insights into this important topic. I now welcome to the e-virtual stage, Parham Antonio Vaisley from uh, Aptiv and also Arthur Kip Furler from Berrels. Um, so without further ado, Parham, as you're leading the event, thank you. Thank you both for coming. And uh, it's over to you, Parham. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much for having me. Um, very excited to be with you here virtually. Um, we were actually planning a physical event together, but now we have to do it virtually. Even better, we can uh, reach even more um, colleagues and uh, people outside. So my name is Parham Vasili. I'm the business unit director at Aptiv um, for autonomous driving. I'm based in uh, Munich, Germany. And uh, today I'm really excited that we have with us uh, Arthur Kiffler from uh, Barrels. Um, I actually met Arthur at my uh, times in England where uh, we both worked at uh, Jaguar Land Rover. Um, at that time, he had a leading role in uh, strategy and corporate planning at Jaguar Land Rover and was uh, looking after a very successful initiative um, to support the organization, steer it towards a more sustainable uh, future. So today, uh, the subject is really to look at the implications of COVID-19, but not so much looking into the past, but looking into the future. Um, where is the industry going to head? What are the opportunities as well, um, both for organization and also for uh, societies and governments as a whole? Um, I remember just in January, um, I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and uh, there we were announcing the decade of action. Obviously, the Sustainable Development Goals are due in 2030. And that doesn't really leave a lot of time um, for us as uh, the uh, corporations, governments, society, to make sure that we all work towards the sustainable development goals. Now, three main subjects came up in uh, the Davos, and one of them obviously was climate change. So we all realizing the urge for change. We all realize that the transformation about the way we operate, uh, the way we uh, behave and, and treat the environment is critical. So here a set of very important actions uh, were taken and automotive was perceived as a very important driver towards these goals. Yeah? The way we produce um, uh, uh, technologies, the way we bring them to market uh, has been a, uh, perceived as a, as a critical change um, positive change driver for the environment. The other one, the other two subjects, um, bringing them together, the one was equality and diversity. So again, a very important subject here to say, how can we make sure that the wider industry, having more female leaders in the businesses, having um, more diverse boards and, and, and management teams, but also allowing a much wider group um, of society to engage in critical industry roles. And again, the automotive also being one major driver for employment has been perceived as, as critical for this. And then finally, upskilling and educating a new generation and also taking with us um, the previous generation when we talk about technologies such as artificial intelligence, automation, um, and so on. So here again, I believe it was widely perceived that the automotive industry uh, must have a leading uh, role uh, in driving the future of our society and achieving the sustainable development goals. Now, we can all argue that um, the situation with COVID-19 has brought us back, um, but really with us today, we also therefore have Arthur, um, who will talk uh, about uh, the current situation, the insights we can gain, but also then we will talk in the Q&A about where should uh, we actually go together, what are the critical aspects to take into account, such as the right strategy, as well as giving the organizations and the individuals within the organization. So the employees, um, the resilience they need um, to be successful in the time to come. Now, 
I think we all recognize that the automotive industry was already going through a major transformation driven by technologies such as autonomous driving, electric vehicles and connectivity. Um, at the same time, we had some more softer uh, trends which emerged, such as urbanization, yeah? such as Generation Y, which is a fundamentally different way um, uh, of uh, looking at products and services. Now, obviously, the COVID-19 situation has not only changed or mutated some of these previous trends, but introduced some new trends. So today we want to also talk about them. Some of which you have heard about are, for example, production slowdowns, consumer slowdown in terms of confidence has been lower, but also some of the mobility services has been suspended because of health and safety reasons. So all of which um, has really brought um, a situation uh, to the surface, which is quite critical. And the automotive and mobility industry as such is not only represented, obviously, by the big tier one suppliers and the OEM companies. It's a huge value chain involved in delivering products and services to market, but also maintain these services, right? So we shall not forget uh, about the people and, and the organizations from the sales and services, um, all the garages, all the other services which are related to maintaining this ecosystem, as well as the financial institution insurances. So all in all, the automotive industry is a very important driver, is a very important sector um, to, to maintain and ensure success uh, going forward. So with this, I really would like to introduce and give the stage over to, to Arthur Kipfler um, to give us a little bit more insights. And then Arthur, if you don't mind, afterwards, I have a couple of questions for us and we will also engage into a live Q&A with the audience. So if you have any questions you would like to ask us uh, about the uh, presentation, about the content, then please uh, forward them through the channel and uh, we will try to address as many as we can. So with no further ado, Arthur, the stage is yours. Thanks, Parham, and thanks, Peter, for having me here today. Um, let me quickly introduce myself. Um, I've been in the industry for 30 years now, so I've been in, in a few crises and also came through a few crises. And at every single one of those times, it seemed like this is this is it, this is, this is the real crisis. And then there was another one that nobody had expected. So here we go, COVID is the latest. Um, let me introduce my company also. Um, if we can put the slides on, please. So Barrels is something, uh, is a, certainly a business most of you will not have heard of. That's why I want to spend a minute introducing us. We are a top management consultancy and unlike many others, we exclusively focus on the automotive and, and mobility industry. Founded in 2011 in Germany, now with a global network of offices, um, a team of, of very experienced consultants. So we don't really have the typical youngsters that, that learn in their first three projects, but we hire people who have already learned in industry jobs and other consulting jobs. Um, but we offer the whole spectrum of management consulting services from strategy design, M&A services, all the way through performance improvement, implementation, help, and, and digital services, more important than ever before. The way we work is very individualized uh, as advisors on, on par with our clients um, with a strong interest in long-term relationships and a very deep understanding of the situation and, and the business uh, context of everything we work on. Um, this, this has paid off and I'm always very proud to show this slide. It's based on a survey that is done regularly by, by a university institute with actual clients and we're very proud to win in the automotive industry uh, in terms of best understanding of, of the industry. Um, and you see the other names on here and it's, it's quite uh, a pleasing experience for a company with 60 people uh, to be rated ahead of these giants of consulting. Um, but now let's let's move on to the actual context of today's session. Um, what's happening to our industry? And waiting for the slide to change. Yes, it does. Slight delay because obviously it all goes through the internet. Um, we all know that we've been in trouble before. There was a lot of doubt in the investor community, and that's one of the bellwethers, obviously, of how sustainable an industry is um, on, on the business model of, of making cars in general. And you can see on the chart um, how the market capitalization of the key players has developed. Uh, a lot of value was, was lost. And at the same time, 
even a little bit of volume was lost uh, because it seems we have reached peak car um, with a lot of reasons for it. One of them obviously being congestion, uh, not more space for more cars. So the big question is what happened to this industry that had already faced severe challenges, uh, had lost the trust of investors, uh, had to struggle with profitability challenges, with technological challenges. What has happened now with, with COVID? And as so often in, 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 in our business, it's not an easy question. One thing we know for sure, COVID is definitely not making anything easier. So um, I spent nine years in Toyota and one of the pictures we, we tended to use there was the, the canal with the rocks at the bottom and then the old story of draining the canal um, to expose the rocks and making everybody more aware of the hidden problems and then becoming better. So COVID is, is one of these phenomenons that's definitely draining our canal, um, which means that obviously people who are less apt in navigating will have trouble and some of them might hit rocks and, and sink their ship. Um, but if we look a little bit deeper into the whole story, we can take a few dimensions to make that easier. Um, and, and we see the two prong effect that uh, COVID really has on, on our industry. So big topic has been for everybody, obviously case. Um, connected, automated or autonomous, shared and electric, uh, the four mega trends that have put huge strains on R&D budgets, on the business models of car makers um, and, and that have caused a bit of that trust loss that, that we saw on the previous slide. So what happens now with COVID? Well, on the one hand, something negative. Definitely, we, we saw that the whole shared mobility usage is going down. Um, a lot of the services that were built with a lot of money and subsidized uh, have not had any revenues. Um, definitely, we saw a big drop in car sales, both new and used. No wonder if uh, all the shops were closed worldwide. But we also see positives here. We see definitely a preference um, to go back to cars because people don't want public transportation. They are uh, afraid of getting infected. Uh, secondly, big topic, obviously, profitability. Returns in the industry have been falling uh, in the last few years after a very nice rebound after the financial crisis in 2010. Um, so what does COVID do here? Definitely reinforces the whole problem because lost revenue will not be made up. Lost production is gone. Um, discounts will go up and it will also reduce the ability to invest into new technologies, into the for example, the the double uh, burden of further developing your ice powertrains while at the same time developing your electric powertrains. Very important for our industry, obviously, consumer behavior. Is that changing? In the past, we, we read out of case that obviously buying a car is much less emotionally important for many consumers. Having access to transportation, is it what they're really looking for? Is that changing? Well. Again, two-prong approach. Um, on the reducing side, we see definitely less willingness to travel and less need to travel. We'll, we'll see how much of working from home will actually remain common practice. Um, are people still going on vacations as much as they did before? We don't know. And, and we'll have to see how behavior changes. Um, but a hardcore change definitely is a reduced ability to spend. Many companies cut bonuses, cut salaries, a lot of people are actually losing their jobs and, and that will be money that's not available anymore to be spent on vehicles. Um, on, the, on the positive side, I think we see definitely an emergence of e-commerce. Um, many people who so far were a bit shy to buy a car online are now ready to it because they had to buy basically everything online in, in the months of lockdown. And we definitely see a, a reinforcement of the whole deal seeking. Uh, our industry is plagued with discounts, uh, and that is something that is not being made easier by COVID. Um, another big topic uh, here, supply chains. The, the car industry probably has among the most globalized supply chains of, of all industries. And in the past, we, we were really pushing that for competitiveness reasons, for cost reasons, and also because it was it was uh, enabled by a movement to more free trade. Now, Mr. Trump had already reversed that momentum and definitely COVID is, is helping here to reduce uh, the movement to a positive. On the reinforcement side, um, we see that all those global interdependencies obviously always had a risk and now this risk has been made very, very visible. Um, similar to, for example, what the Fukushima 
um, nuclear accident did back in 2011, I think that was, um, where suddenly everybody realized that most of their special pigment come from one factory on a northern Japanese island and nobody had known that. Um, what we also will see in our supply chains that the burden of overcapacity that we have built up over the years will be harder to bury. Um, and we'll see how we deal with that. And lastly, uh, since car companies are obviously companies employing a lot of people, the whole impact on the on the workplace and the culture and the way we collaborate will be enormous. Um, there's certainly a reduction of natural attrition because job markets have contracted um, and it's not so easy anymore to, to just wait for people to go away. On the other hand, we'll probably have some positive effects that will make it easier to deal with the challenges um, everybody got used to remote working and, and a new spirit and flexibility hopefully has uh, entered a lot of industries. So just a bit more detail on, on each of those so you get some more um, practical flesh on the bones. If we go back to the first topic, e-mobility, automated driving, I think it is undeniable that some of these projects will be delayed. Um, there is obviously simply a break because a lot of people were on furlough and these projects were not mission critical. So these people have been put on furlough in many of the organizations. And then, as I said before, we'll have uh, a pressure on funding. So there will be reviews of project portfolios in, in, in all these companies going on. Um, the question is, what is still mission critical? What has to continue? And, and in our perspective, e-mobility is, is something that cannot uh, be slowed down. We still have global warming, we still have all the regulation on CO2 and other emissions, uh, and we will need to continue to electrify. Uh, a topic that's much more uh, on the question list is, is new mobility. Um, first of all, we don't really know how mobility is going to develop in the next few years. Secondly, these were more nice to have investments for quite a few players, and they were not making money. So the question here is, how do we reevaluate uh, new mobility business cases, the investments that are in the portfolios, and, and we expect quite a few exits here. Uh, if it can't be sold, it will simply be shut down. And then with even more uncertainty now in the world, how do you diversify? How do you evaluate new ideas in the business? Um, we all know the industry has to keep transforming itself. Um, new opportunities obviously have to be grabbed, but uh, now we have an additional dimension of uncertainty that's not going to make these decisions easier. Moving on to margin pressure, um, I think we can cover that very quickly. There is much less money in the system in, in, in all players now. And so how do we prioritize long-term investments versus short-term cash preservation is going to be an art, uh, not so much a science uh, and it will definitely impact uh, the future success of a lot of the players. Um, everybody has to reduce investment while still delivering. Um, so we will see a lot more push towards collaborations. People will have to be more open to work with partners and competitors on certain things um, just to, to get the stuff done. And then we will need to see this balance and, and here obviously important aspect, your people, your other stakeholders, can you just push for cash preservation, uh, lay off as many people as possible, or do you actually have to think a little bit longer term? And it's interesting to watch, for example, the different statements that uh, leaders make if they work for Toyota, or if they work, for example, for, uh, if we just saw it here, um, the, the aerospace companies in America. Obviously, um, Toyota is a lot more attached to a long-term thinking, to their people, to the benefits to society, whereas if you are publicly traded business in America, you have to deliver to your shareholders and, and you just let 20,000 people go if you don't have a job for them tomorrow. Um, talking about customer behavior, um, really, really good to see how customers have moved online. I mean, our industry has been the last one, I think, in, in all industries to digitalize the consumer front end. Um, it had to be done by third parties like uh, the, the startups that, that made e-commerce happen in, in our industry, everybody else was kind of dragging their feet. Uh, now with the showrooms closed, suddenly a lot of the salespeople learned how to sell cars per email. And, and uh, I have a few dealers I work with very closely and they really had good order intakes. And it was not that the business stopped, uh, we just had moved online. And we had salespeople who took that opportunity 
by the horns and uh, sold four cars after Saturday night's dinner. That's something that would have not been done before because showroom's closed, I'm not answering emails. So here's something that's positive, um, but on the other hand, obviously we have uh, influence on consumer behavior in the sense of I have less money, I want a better deal, or I will use my car longer, I will push my purchases out. Um, and we'll really have to see how, how now, especially in Europe, where we're driving across borders is a big thing, how the whole travel restrictions will go away quickly. Because if I cannot fly on vacation, I would love to drive. If I cannot cross the borders, there's really no reason to buy a new car for a vacation. So it is kind of a, a very complex system that has to be put back into motion all the way from pubs opening uh, through to borders opening. And that might have a huge impact on demand. I think in, in quite a few countries, the, the first signals are quite positive. I mean, we had order intake through the shutdown. Um, we have very good showroom traffic in some other countries now. China, as you all saw in the statistics, uh, sales are back above last year's level. Um, so the downward trend really has been kind of turned around. Um, we don't really know how much of that was pent up demand from three months of lockdown. How much of that is this new movement to, I don't want to go in public transportation, so I buy a second car for the family. Um, we'll have to watch it closely, but definitely uh, among the key questions here is how do I avoid overreactions now? Um, like what is the right mix between supply and demand? How fast do I ramp up the plant to avoid waiting times, to avoid undersupply, uh, but also to avoid oversupply and then the resulting uh, discount battle? Um, in terms of the digitalization, I put the question down here, how do we deal with third parties? It has been an unsolved question before, it's still an unsolved question now, but with the digital part of the whole sales and marketing chain being so much more important, this question is ever more urgent than before. So I think uh, a lot of projects in OEM organizations will have to focus on these questions now, no matter if the people work from home or, or if they're already in the office. Supply chains, big topic, and, and not just a COVID topic. As I said before, we had a, a trend already away from globalization because of Mr. Trump and more nationalistic thinking of many government leaders, also because of sustainability. Does it really make sense to ship things three times around the world before they are being put into a car? Um, so a lot of thinking now in car companies has to go around how do we design our future supply chain more resiliently and more sustainably um, without giving up the cost advantage? Because the one thing we know for sure, consumers do not want to pay more for their vehicle. They will simply walk away. So the cost cannot be increased. It cannot be passed on in terms of pricing. So we need to find a way to be um, inherently more efficient. And then obviously short term task here also, how do we ramp up again? How do we find signals that a supplier is almost not going to make it and we need to put special help in place uh, whereas others might not need help um, in a supply chain that is not really fully digitalized yet and that is also uh, not really transparent especially if we go down to, uh, a few tiers in the organization um, a big question related to supply chain obviously is the whole um, core capability core competency question what should manufacturers do themselves? What should they outsource? How should they outsource? Do they partner? Do they simply buy to print? Um, also, again, uh, not something new, but a question that has gained new dynamics through the current crisis and that needs a solution. Um, then in terms of the workplace, um, I guess we all work from home. We do conferences from home, so we've learned new things. Um, as, as a consulting business, we have done board workshops um, with 12, 15 people um, over six hours, all through video conference. If you had suggested that six months ago, people would have said, are you crazy? This is never going to work. Uh, it now has worked. So how, how can we preserve that, that agility and carry it over into, into the work life after the crisis? Because it is a lot more uh, Efficient, not only for people like me who travel from one client to the other, uh, which obviously is much easier with a mouse click than with an airplane, um, but also for companies. There are global businesses with many locations. And um, Parham, uh, if we think back to our JLR times, how much time did we spend driving back and forth between 
Coventry and Gaydon, which is only 20 minutes, but it's still 20 minutes every time. Um, a lot of that could have been avoided by just using a video conference tool, but it was not common practice. So a lot of that will probably now become current practice. Uh, and, and I didn't put it on the slide, but the obviously short term question here is how do we make the workplaces safe for people to feel safe to come in? Because obviously a lot of people are really worried about getting infected and they don't want to go to an office that is not safe. Um, yeah. So if I put it all together on one slide, um, definitely in a summary sentence, not much new from COVID. I think our industry was not fatally hit and it was also not magically cured by the virus. So we have a lot of tasks, especially in the short term, short -term side that have been reinforced uh, and we still have all the tasks that we had on the long term side that we had to do before. I think one thing that really stands out as, as a COVID measure with the whole collapse of, of value in, in, in the industry, in the stock markets, uh, is there an opportunity for strategic acquisitions for certain players? Obviously requiring that yourself as the acquirer, you still have that financial flexibility and the funds, um, but there's definitely now things out there that, that you could pick up uh, that were simply overvalued or valued too highly uh, six months ago. And I think it will also give us a, a push, a need to think more holistically. If you think of scenario analysis and planning, um, I don't think anybody had in any of their scenarios a shutdown for three months. I've never done it. We've discussed it in scenario planning exercises and it was kind of in the World War III category where you said, well, if that comes, then we'll have to deal with it, but we're not going to think about it now. We're not going to plan for it. And now we suddenly all had to plan for it and, and deal with it. So I think in the future, people will draw their scenarios a little broader and, and have more kind of worst case and extreme cases in it. So that's, that's my summary and, and quickly um, trying to go through a bit of content, but uh, I think the most interesting part of the session today is the discussion. So Param, how do we move on? Thank you so much. And I think uh, you summarized it really well at the end as well. I think it's a great opportunity for us to really move on and uh, use this uh, kind of uh, force which came upon us um, positively. So on the same note, I mean, we talked about the industry going already through a transformation. And, and really, if we're honest, the, the mobility and automotive industry is long overdue a system upgrade, right? I mean, the last update we had really was from the horses to the, to the automobile. Yes, we had, of course, uh, much more comfortable vehicles now, much safer vehicles and efficient vehicles now. But uh, the mega trends you talked about, they were really there to fundamentally transform the industry. Do you think that will continue with the same pace or do you see um, the, the mega trends we saw before are going to slow down a little bit or maybe even not fundamentally change the product as we know it uh, today? Mm -hmm. Uh, as I said, I think it's a mixed picture. Certain things will continue because they have forces that that are completely independent of what happened now. And we will have to, to just deal with it. So I think urbanization is still going to happen because cities are where economic activity happens. So people want to move to cities and there's a big benefit from it for everybody. And, and it will continue to happen. Even if now, if you saw in, in India, everybody walking home for a while, but they will come back because where they live, there's no way to, to make money. So cities will remain important. So we will have to deal with mobility problems in cities and pollution problems in cities. Um, this, this is not going to go away. I think some of the trends will actually find reinforcement. So if you think of the trend to more sustainable vehicles, which for us is, is obviously a big topic. Um, a lot will depend now on government incentives, uh, the support programs that come in after COVID and, and the amounts that are being talked about are simply staggering. You know, it's a, nobody talks millions, it's always at least billions. Um, if they are really targeting sustainable vehicles more so than vehicles in general, um, we'll see a, uh, probably an acceleration of electrification, for example. Um, so yeah, mixed picture, some things will go faster, some things will go a bit slower, but overall I don't see a big change to the trajectory, the, the mobility world, if you want, was moving before. 
we'll definitely have to in in the in the services end obvi obviously everything depends on recovery of demand as long as no restaurants are open in our country there will be no need for mobility service nobody's calling an uber if he stays at home um, so this is a, a very short term uh, i think uh, problem that that will be resolved in the midterm, once things are being open again and people going about their lives again, they have to get to work, they have to go to see their friends and to activities, whatever it is. Um, it slowly, slowly will move back up the curve. Um, if there is a hesitation to use public transport in the sense of vehicles with many, many people in it in a, in a crowded way, um, there might be a boom for individual mobility services. It's much easier to to socially distance in an Uber than it is in a tram or a bus or a subway. So even if mass events will still take a few, I don't know, years to be held again, and there might still be solid demand for mobility services um, because of that shyness to use public transportation. So right. I, I fully agree. I think that's really an opportunity to um, look forward and uh, really achieve uh, some of the um, uh, goals more for more sustainable and climate um, change um, and also from a safety point of view. I mean, we all are looking forward to get uh, better and safer products on the road. Now, these were the old uh, mega trends. Are you seeing something new emerging due to the crisis? I mean, you talked and you touched about um, that the mobility services had to suspend their operations because of some health and safety concerns for both the driver and the, and the, and the passengers. Do you see, therefore, some new trends emerging in that area or, or any other area of uh, the industry, which now we have to also address? on top of the uh, previous ones? Uh, honestly, I don't think there's something really new. There is acceleration, like digitalization de definitely will go faster, will have better acceptance and therefore will also be easier to push faster. But I, I don't really think there is something newly born out of this. Um, if we think back to previous crises, like the, the financial crisis 2009, 10, 11, that's still quite fresh in our memories, um, it, it was very similar. It just made everything a lot more difficult. But then the recovery from the crisis created a momentum of its own that, that was quite pleasant, actually. So everybody was very pained by the sales collapse. I remember I worked in the US at that time. Our market collapsed from 17 and a half million to 10 and a half million within 12 months. It was extremely painful. But then the years from 2011 to 2018, when the market grew back from 10.5 to 17.5 million, was great. Every year was a new record year and, you know, you needed more capacity and more money was made and everybody was happy and share prices went up and people enjoyed their new cars. So it's like a crisis, as soon as it's over, almost becomes a positive momentum because you have this recovery, which is, which is a positive feeling and that makes everybody somehow happy. So I can definitely see that that happening too now if if the after effects are not too persistent in terms of border closures and social distancing rules so that they remain like a, a ball and chain to the recovery. But if we get over this reasonably quickly, I think we can see a, a really good recovery momentum that will help us to overcome some of those challenges that were there before. Talking about the recovery, I mean, recovery, one fundamental aspect of that is also to be resilient, both the organization and also the people and the employees of the organization. Yeah. Do you have some strategies, some ideas organizations now need to look after and adopt to become resilient going forward? Yes, I think risk management in general will have a revival. Um, people will look at their processes with a wider horizon, as I said before. So um, you will probably include some more extreme scenarios. You will include safety and insurance against events that before you said, oh, it's anyway not going to happen. We'll, we'll just uh, deal with it when it happens. Um, many of our supply chains were kind of yeah, built on thin ice and, and relied on everything happening. And usually if something happened, we just reacted with air freight. And instead of putting things in a container on a ship, we flew it by airplane and somehow the cost was okay because we saved a lot in, in the original 
and probably a lot of people will think slightly more risk averse and put more safety, more buffer stocks, more double sourcing into their supply chains. Um, but what COVID also taught us is many of the disturbances nowadays are truly global. So it doesn't really help you to have a second supplier in, in Asia to back up your European first supplier if both regions shut down because the crisis is global. So it's kind of a, you know, a new normal in the world is, yes, global is really meant like it. Things happen in sync around the world. And this balancing and security between regions is not really uh, a means. Correct. I mean, that is certainly something to look at it from an organization process and, and, and methods point of view. And I do agree there are certain things we now have to take much more um, serious and, and they have to appear much often, uh, I would say, on the on the discussion tables. At the same time, I think from, from my own point of view, we also have to, of course, work even further on the resilience of our employees. Yeah? So we have to work and give them the right mental and cognitive capabilities to deal with the situations um, and see the opportunities. I think that would be certainly something which is a recommendation. So also from my side to say that the organizations already today have to work on that and give the employees the right tools and the methods uh, to deal with that. Yeah, I think emotional intelligence, the ability to collaborate, work in teams virtually is also fundamentally different from the way we had to operate previously, right? So here uh, that uh, will also allow organizations to explore and new trainings will emerge, which we certainly should uh, pick up to make sure that, you know, everybody stays at their best uh, also with working at home going forward. Yeah. Um, now, I would like to uh, ask then the audience for um, some live questions, um, which I will receive from um, uh, Peter yourself. Uh, let's uh, wait a second for that, and then we can um, engage in some of the questions. Maybe I can ask you a question, since you know sure. I'm mostly working with car makers, uh, and, and you're obviously in the supplier industry. How, how did it feel from a supplier perspective? Because obviously you don't have the, the direct exposure to the frontline data, um, but you know what's coming your way with a delay. Did you feel you were properly informed by the OEMs? Did you know what's going on or did you have to make up your own truth and, and basically uh, take risky measures? I think it really is both. I mean, I have the advantage. I've been on both sides. I've been with an OEM before and, and now in, in the supply chain. So I think I can look at it from, from both angles. We know there is a certain delay in terms of the customer reaction and the ordering coming in to when the OEM actually then feels that pressure. At the same, we had the, the same feeling from a supply chain point of view. I mean, of course, we had to set up our own strategies. I was very fortunate that my organization acted very, very early. So very early, um, we were limiting travels, we were putting the safety of our employees first. So that I really uh, do appreciate. And I think we, we certainly looking backwards now, have done the right thing. Although in the beginning, um, it was very alien for uh, many people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's both really uh, the, the suppliers, tier one, tier two suppliers had to really work by themselves to manage the supply chain and their value chain. But having a very close collaboration and staying very close with your customers, in that case, the OEMs, has been a fundamental part of our success and the way that we have really dealt with the crisis um, uh, in, a, in a sustainable and efficient way. Of course, um, you cannot change market situations. You cannot fundamentally change uh, the impact these things have on your customers and uh, as being the OEMs. But the strong collaboration, very short communication uh, lines um, really has helped um, to uh, maintain confidence both for our employees and towards our customers. Mm -hmm. So having that transparency and that continuous conversation is uh, really critical. Yeah. And as you work in autonomous driving mostly, um, do you think you have lost time and will slow down or will we see still autonomous vehicles at the time we would have seen them without COVID? Um, well, that's uh, that's always the one million dollar question about the yeah. timing for for your thing. I mean, again, the the announcements from the various organizations, um, they maybe not always result as we know in the big bang 
um, solutions and the transformation we uh, they originally were expected to deliver. But overall, I have great confidence in the industry. I have great confidence in uh, the supply chain. You know, even in the wider. Um, industry and the sector, the OEMs, the other competitors, the academic partners. I think all in all, I see a very positive trend moving forward that, like you said, many organizations are also now talking with each other. So that is certainly a positive. Many realize that we can only address this problem and this challenge jointly, um, building consortiums, building working groups and discussions groups. So that has, even before the crisis, have been a very positive, and I see this positive trend continuing. So I have um, personally uh, and also professionally very uh, positive outlook on the whole industry, both uh -huh. for safety and the ADAS solutions, as well as the high levels of automation when we talk about autonomous driving. Absolutely. We have um, two questions maybe um, uh, we can have a look at or, or one of them, certainly in the yeah. time we just have left. Um, you talked about the, the shared mobility um, uh, organizations and they had to suspend their operations. Do you think these organizations have to fundamentally change the way they operate, maybe the engagement with the customer, or do you think that, that will continue as it is and maybe they will add the one or the other health and safety feature um, to the operation? You know, you're asking the wrong person probably because I was a critic before of, of this whole segment because I just could not see how an inherently unprofitable service offering uh, will ever survive. Um, now they had to shut down for a while, which basically cut their losses because they didn't have to provide subsidized services for a while. So probably it actually did them a favor. Uh, in terms of changes to their business, I think um, if you talk about shared ride hailing, so Uber, Lyft uh, and other services, I think they've reacted fairly quickly. It's easy to put dividers in the car, it's easy to put wipes in the car, disinfectant, so people feel safer and, and are probably safer. Um, if you talk about the micro mobility services like rental bikes and scooters, I think people will just have to get over it. I mean, they are so unprofitable. You cannot, they cannot afford to go out and wipe the handlebars of the scooters every time somebody wrote it. And if they attach a little disinfectant, it will be stolen and lost. So, I mean, it's everybody's own responsibility to wash your hands after you use the shared scooter. And some people will not use them because they're scared and others will continue to use them. So I don't think it's a, a, a big... Uh, change driven by the virus. The main problems of that part of our industry are how do you reach sustainable profitability at a price point that's still attractive to consumers. Right, correct, correct. And maybe also some redesigns of the user experience, the internal design, maybe um, these kind of things will, will also emerge. Good, so I think we have uh, reached the, the end of our time. So Arthur, thank you so much. That was uh, very informative. Um, so, Peter, with that, uh, I give uh, back to you. And Peter's on mute. All oh, the lip readers among the audience will know what he says. That always happens if you... I'm still lost. Now we can hear you. Oh, hear excellent. You well, yeah. really, that was a technology challenge created by me because to not give you any feedback during your presentation, I just forgot to unmute what I was about to say. Yeah. So apologies, the world, for that. Um, really good session, thank you. Um, lots of... Um, Thought-provoking ideas for the future. Interesting topic for me on dealership with orders um, by internet and not face-to-face. -face. Will car dealerships in the future become more virtual? Will you just Definitely. select online, as you would probably a lease, and not have that physical experience? Will public transport become more user-friendly? and be able to be defined, as I, th I think someone else mentioned. And can we design a vehicle interior that's easier to sterilize? 
in the event that there is a problem without all the little gaps and, and nooks and crannies. So yeah. we've got lots to think about and lots to move forward. Uh, we have reached time, so thank you again. Uh, look forward to anyone joining us next week. Um, we will also update next week on what we hope to be live will most probably be a virtual live uh, for June. So thank you again and uh, keep safe. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.